Um, well, welcome everybody to our, gosh, what month is it already? Is it May? May. Yes. May. <laughs> oh, I feel months. like the year is just flying by. Mm, so our great. May uh, 2023 uh, book club meeting, and um, I'm Carolyn, if I haven't met any of you, um, so happy that you're here and, and joined by uh, Wendy and Sally, our book club hosts. Is anyone new tonight that hasn't been here at a book club meeting? Hi, have you? Yeah, yeah. Susan, hi. Hi. Welcome. Do you want to say hi yeah. and introduce yourself? I am in Seattle and I'm an author and an executive coach and a mad traveler. And I just love your postings and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm usually in another time zone. So I made it this time. That's great. You're well, very welcome, welcome Susan. Yeah. Good to have mm -hmm. you here. Um, so the way these work is I'm going to talk for just a couple seconds, not too long, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Wendy to moderate a discussion. Um, tonight we have two uh, people joining us, uh, well, who are here already, I should say, that are uh, going to give us a little extra um, depth into T, um, which is Brenda. And Brenda's on our Journey Woman Advisory Council. And Donnie Below, who runs a tour company called Girls Guide to the World, is going to come and join us. She's just come back from Japan. So I asked her if she would come and kind of fill us in on what's happening in Japan and what her perspective is. She told me uh, earlier this week that Japan is one of her top three uh, countries in the world. And she is uh, a very, very experienced traveler, as you can imagine, running a, running a tour company. Um, but I'm curious, has anyone here been to Japan? Yes. A lot of people. Okay, so we can share our advice and share our tips. And the only other thing, there's two other things I just want to mention before we, uh, before we start. Um, one is that we are trying our best to support women authors. So we have a session next week on uh, the 25th, which is going to highlight some authors in the Journey Woman community. I hope you can all join us. I'll put the link in the chat in a little bit. Um, so these are women that have written their own books and we wanna obviously support them and give them a bit of a platform to share their stories and their journeys. Um, Sally is one of them. <laughs> and uh, she's just come back from Greece actually. and She's completely jet lagged. So, <laughs> so we'll see how, <laughs> but she's got her robe on. So isn't that great? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh there's nepal there's cape horn and um guatemala are the four countries that we'll travel to and then the week after that uh karen gershowitz who is also one of our writers is uh is going to kind of preview her new book with us which is called wanderlust and it's all about quirky places and strange cuisine and things like that so um, so Karen's going to join us and talk a bit about solo travel and share some of her funny anecdotes with us. So I hope you can, you can come to both of those events. If, if you have, you know, it's journey woman every week, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you can come that, that would be great. And we've got a lot of other exciting news coming up that I can't wait to share with you, um, um, about amplifying women's voices and other things that we're doing. So it's, it's, heading into summer here, an exciting, um, an exciting time. Um, I had the opportunity to interview Rebecca Copeland about the book, and she also shared some wonderful tips about Kyoto. She's so generous with her time and, and her knowledge. And so if you haven't read those articles, please do take a look. And um, uh, she's just a lovely person. So I think this is uh, this is a really interesting book for us, and I'm really happy to be profiling a book from Asia because we haven't really mm. talked about uh, Asia yet in our book club. So with that, Wendy, I will turn it over to you as I get my oh, tea nice. organized. And uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Well, hello, everybody. Um, for those of you who are new, my name is Wendy Brook. And uh, basically, the way we do this, I'll talk a little bit about the author, and then I have questions and it's just really, it's a matter of sharing your thoughts, sharing your ideas. Um, and we can go in various directions. The questions are really more prompts 
It doesn't mean we have to stick with those. We can sort of take some side paths as we go through the questions as well. So. A little bit about uh, Rebecca Copeland. And I, if you haven't read Carolyn, Karen wrote two articles um, about Japan and, and with Rebecca, and they're both excellent. One of them is really a lot, a whole, a whole article about tips and tricks and etiquette in Japan. Um, and the other is just an overall sort of her philosophy and, and living in Japan and a little bit about the book. Um, Rebecca Copeland is a professor of Japanese language and literature at Washington University, which is in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. She also has served as a translator. What I found interesting about her, <clears throat> and some of this, for those of you who have read the book, um, might hear some of this might sound a little familiar. Her parents were missionaries in Japan. She, she did traditional dance. She also did translation. Um, and so some of the things that we see in the book, she, she made it very clear, these are no, it's not her biography in any way, but um, she is drawing from some of her experiences. She was born in Japan, uh, but they left when she was only three weeks old and they moved back to the US. And she didn't go back to Japan until she was a junior in college when she spent a semester abroad. At that time, um, she then decided to go into Japanese language and literature. Uh, as later, when she did her PhD, uh, she went to Japan for five years to do her dissertation research. Uh, and as she said, she's been going back ever since. Um, she did spend, she, in 2004, she taught for a year in Kyoto. And she says that a lot of, when she started writing this book, she didn't have to do a lot of research about Kyoto because she'd walked the street so many times and the philosopher's pathway was a way that she walked. She lived behind the zoo. So a lot of these places that she describes were things that she saw on a regular basis. Um, she's always been fascinated about the kimono and a couple of things about the kimono that I hadn't been aware of um, is that after the life, you know, there's a, she did a lot of research in terms of, there's a, a, an article called After the Life of Japanese Textiles. Because what I was not aware of is that the kimono, um, because these were these beautiful paintings on cloth, once they had served their purpose as a, as a wardrobe, many times they were used um, and they went, they were refashioned into altar cloths for the church. And so at one point in the book, they're talking about how they, they there's an altar cloth and they, they unstitch it to see what the color would have been like um, originally. Well, but that's because that was a very common practice was to use some of the most beautiful garments and save them as altar cloths. The, the fragments were repurposed. The other thing she talks about is that the kimonos are made out of living things. They're made out of plants. You know, the dyes are made out of plants, insects, you know, of course, silkworms uh, make the silk. And so um, she, she looks at it from a very organic perspective. So that's a little bit about um, her in general. And now we'll talk a little bit about the book. And so the first question we always ask is, did you have a favorite section in the book or a favorite part? And I will share mine. And then if anybody wants to also share, um, I like it. It was only about halfway through the book when um, she, when Ruth goes to the sort of the master of um, the master kimono maker. And he talks to her about, um, he said, Grandfather Yun Sun Sei painted on silk all the time. So he was not particularly impressed with painter's skill, but what fascinated him was even after the remnant had been lashed <laughs> by raindrops and splattered with spray from the river, it did not smear or spot. The paintings <laughs> held up. He was, highly he was a highly regarded painter and orders from around the country for his designs. He painted on fans, pottery, and sliding doors. He also painted on kimonos, but his pa kimono paintings were always vulnerable to the weather. Women mostly wore his painted fabrics indoors, terrified of being caught outside in a sudden downpour. Their beautiful designs would disappear before their very eyes. Of course, the impertinence and fragility and it were aesthetically appealing. 
but he wanted his paintings, paintings to be less susceptible to the caprices of weather. Mm. And you know what, to me, what fascinated me about this, this particular passage is I had not thought about kimonos really just being a canvas for a beautiful mm. painting. I'd always thought of them as being a piece of clothing. And so this real, that passage really, to me, um, completely changed my whole perspective of what a kimono was. Mm. Mm. Other thoughts, anybody else has other, other areas? I, I have a piece, but I just wanted to comment on the kimono because sure. when I was um, in Japan, I, was, uh, I realized that they were beautiful works of art, especially, when I was told that people could spend the equivalent of buying a car on a, a, a kimono for a special occasion or whatever, like a bridal one or something like that, that, you know, that, that they definitely were regarded as works of art, not just as pieces of clothing. Yes, yeah, it's really interesting. Mm. And so my passage, and it's not, it's not really to do with kimonos or anything, but it, it just struck me as something that was really, a really beautiful piece of writing. Um, this was one of my favourite times of day. It was approaching twilight, mm. tasugare in Japanese, a magical time caught between day and night when the sun slipping beneath the, with the sun slipping beneath the horizon the light is uncertain making it difficult to distinguish what is seen the word in japanese alludes to this vagueness unable to see who is walking towards you in the twilight you will call out who is that or tasugare as it would have been in um, years past in classic plays and ghost tales, Tasugare is the time of day when strange things happen, when peculiar creatures step out of the shadows, when dream worlds become real. Oh, I just really nice. love that piece. Yeah, very nice. Yes, yeah, Sally. I, yeah, I usually choose the very poetic pieces and there were many of those in this mm. book. It was lovely, but for once I've chosen something quite different as my favorite passage. And it's the scene where the police or the police, we should say, barge into Ruth's apartment. And it's very short. It just says, he and his partner followed me inside, roughly kicking their shoes off. I was startled by their boldness. Usually people do not step up into a house without being invited, but nothing about this encounter was ordinary. And for me, it was just such a, this, this so much cultural difference in those few lines, the idea of these, this quite brutal encounter with the police <laughs> who barge into a house, but they take their shoes off. <laughs> <they come> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and the, 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 the kind of ingrained etiquette, which is so very different from the etiquette I'm used to, that it would be unthinkable, even in those circumstances, to wear your shoes in someone else's house. Mm. <laughs> it it me. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. All right, let me just move over Mary to some Bush? of the questions. Uh, sorry, Wendy, Mary's got a hand up. Oh, yeah, Mary Beth. Hi. Um, I liked I liked Margaret's passage and I thought, well, if someone chooses that, I have a different one that I will choose yeah. if she chose it. So <laughs> I um I like this one and I'll tell you why after I read it. It says, um, Maho and I sorted through the items once we were in our taxis heading back to my house. An envelope of gift cards, a small packet of tea, and a little bag of salt. Maho told me. I was supposed to sprinkle the salt over my shoulder before I entered my house to ward off impurity of death. And it just reminded me of how every place we travel around the world, there's certain customs and certain things that we're supposed to do and colors that we're supposed to wear for a funeral, colors that we wouldn't wear here would be insulting yeah. Just, there's so mm, many yes. special little nuances of every little region and Japan when I was there 
Um, I was there for, um, I lived in Asia for several years, so I had the opportunity to visit Japan. And there were so many little things. I'd go to visit someone. What should I take as the hostess gift? Should I take chocolate? Should I take flowers? Should I take this? Should I take that? What? There, so that's what mm. why I like that passage is a reminder of yeah. how we all have our special um, nuances. Yeah. Definitely. So true. Yeah. Now, did did any of you learn anything about kimonos in particular or Japanese culture in general that surprised you? So I've already told you my part. Yep, Carol. <laughs> Yeah, I did not realize that um, they spent so much, paid so much attention to the seasonality of wearing the kimono, that mm -hmm. it would indicate a certain season and a certain mood. I really liked those descriptions. Yeah, for, yeah Peggy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I liked like when the her boss um, went to that meeting with some girl's parents and she spit picked out a special kimono to indicate her intentions, you know, so, and the depth of kimonos, you know, and, and the complication mm -hmm. was just surprising to me. Mm -hmm. um, I thought they were just beautiful articles of clothing, yeah. you know, but mm -hmm. the whole, it, it makes me want to, you know, see a museum exhibit on kimonos yeah. and, right. you know, learn more. Mm -hmm. Dina, what surprised me was that she managed to dress herself. Um, um, the, the times that I've, I mean, I could not even put this, it's summer one that I have with the, it still has an obi and the bow in the back. And so it's not a, it's not, I guess it's a summer kimono, but um, when I was there, and we were all dressing in formal ones, there was a whole room they set aside with people to dress you. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's like, I mean, you've got the board and it pulls you in and there's all that elaborate tying of the OB. And I don't know how she managed to do that by herself. <laughs> <laughs> and Carol, you had something as well? No, I, that's what I was going to say, that I don't know how she did it. And she said she was in the book, the character was more comfortable in oh, the community than she was in the Western dress, which I, I couldn't imagine either. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I was to interested to, um, to read that the taxi driver offered her a kimono discount um, as, as a policy to kind of promote kimono wear in Kyoto. It, mm. that, was, that was fascinating for me. And I just wanted how they run that. I mean, does taxi driver get that money back from a municipal tax or how does it work? <laughs> yeah, Elaine. Hello. Um, so I've lived in Japan for 14 years. Um, I went when I was 40 and just went by myself with no language, no money, no friends, no job, but stayed for 14 years until I fortunately survived a major earthquake. Mm. Um, one of the things that I managed to save in the earthquake were my kimono. Mm. Oh, great. And I had them shipped. But now it was almost like if I, I do go to the markets and if I could find one for a low price, I would buy it just for the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. But as a result, I now have a small apartment with a few closets that are filled with kimono. Oh. I don't know what to do with. Mm. Um, do you have room for them on the walls? I have one on the wall in my bedroom. Mm. Yes. But I have about 15 wedding kimono, several oh. um, beautiful. Several daily kimono and a lot of obi um mm. and they're just beautiful but not practical and even my japanese friends have recently told me they're not wearing the, theirs anymore and they've sold them mm. or whatever mm. they've done with them which is very sad to me because sad, they yeah. are so beautiful so i haven't read the book yet but i am looking forward to it and right. every, it's been interesting to hear what all of you have said. 
and um, which is related from the book. And it's just brought back a flood of memories for mm. me. I mean, everything you said was so real to me. Oh, good, good. And welcome. Since you haven't been Thank with us before, you. so welcome. Yeah. Thank you. I, I hope to be here regularly. Thank good. you. Good. I'm great. Yeah. Yeah, Elena. Um, well, I too have been to Japan, but it was a long time ago. And I went for the International Paper Conference because I'm an artist and they have master paper makers in Japan. But I also was a fiber artist. So I particularly <laughs> love her description of the kimonos and the way they were made and the, how important the designs were related to the season. Um, and also I knew how complicated it was to dress in all of the layers because my brother lives in Hawaii and his first wife was from a Japanese family. So they had a formal official Buddhist wedding and, and I got to photograph the way they dress the bride and the bridesmaids. So it's an amazing culture and it's also so wonderful that they're recycling the ones that are slightly mm -hmm. used was one of the main points of of this whole story related to the plot the talisman that belonged yeah. to the Hani family so I that really enriched the book for me the fact that the author was so knowledgeable about mm -hmm. the I thought yeah. that was very important mm -hmm. as well as the intricacies of the mystery yeah it's, it's very interesting how the author used it. And that ties in, I think, what Elena and Carol and Peggy have all said about monos. Um, when, you, when you're writing, they talk about show, don't tell is a big thing for writers and it's hard. Like you don't, you, you need to find ways to, to have the, the reader kind of immerse themselves in the story and understand a lot about people's characters and about the setting and the season without just telling them this book back. And using the kimono in ways that indicated the weather, the time of year, the intents of the characters, the uh, how formal or informal an occasion is. Um, th there were so many ways that the, the kimonos worn gave information about everything else that was going mm, on in the story yes. without, without mm. the writer having to tell you those things, yeah. which was very impressive. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the kimono is a central part of the, of the novel, but there's also a strong presence of other arts, you know, dance, tattooing, calligraphy, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the meaning of the characters. Have any of you read um, any other works of fiction where a specialized skill or craft Play such a strong narrative in the book. Mm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps not quite as strongly as this one. This one was incredibly intense how those art films played a role. But uh, something that jumped into my head, and it's years since I've read it, there's a book by um, Geraldine Brooks called The People of the Book, which oh, is about. Yeah. Um, manuscripts old manuscripts and restoring and conserving the manuscripts as well as the original skills in creating the manuscripts as i say i don't think it was quite as intensely focused on the craft as this book was but i it, it did spring to mind when i thought about that question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know one of they've the things been, one oh, go ahead i'm sorry so there've also been a few books about perfume Oh, yeah. And the, the 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 making of perfume. There's one that old book I think was written in the fifties or sixties about it was a, a a murder story, it's quite creepy, but about the, about perfume maker skills. So yeah, there, there are a few out there, but nothing I've read recently. You know, one of the one of the arts that's that's discussed in fairly in detail is tattooing, and Maho talks about her own experience of tattooing, how she tried to explain to her parents that tattoos were a way to release her inner self and that that set as Sadoko's tattoos could have been an expression of her self-love um, and that the pain of the process is a kind of language. Um, what did you guys, 
two things. What were your thoughts about having the kimono designs tattooed on her body? And also in terms of your own experience with tattoos, those of you who may have had tattoos, your own experience about what that indicates to you. The Carol. Go ahead, Sally, if you want to. No, 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 go, no, go ahead, Carol. Well, I was really surprised by that theme because the Japanese are not huge fans of the tattoo. As far as the last time I was there, there were still signs in all the hot springs and uh, baths that you couldn't have tattoos. So that did come up in the book. And I was, I thought that was realistic, but I was surprised by it. And I'm pretty fascinated by that, 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 um, that element of the book. Well, I don't know what it says in the book about it, but in my experience, tattoo is um, associated with the Yakuza, which mm -hmm. are the mafia. Um, but there is a book about a woman who's tattooed, and I can't think of the name or the author now. But yes, it would be unusual to see anyone other than no. the Yakuza. Yeah. Now I had visualized, and I have no idea what what kind of visualizations you had, but I had sort of visualized that if she had on her her kimono with the painting, that when she took the kimono off, that the tattoo represented the painting, the same painting that was mm. on the kimono, mm. that, so mm. that she was always wearing it. Yeah, Elena. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, um... I was under the impression that the tattoos that she had put on her body were related to the fragment, yep. not just any mm. tattoo, any kimono that she mm. had at the moment, mm -hmm. but were a very specific yeah. Yeah, historical yeah. from that fragment. Because I, as I, if I'm remembering correctly, didn't she make drawings of that fragment because she yep. snuck it into the warehouse mm -hmm. and so. Um, that was the meaning I got from it, that she integrated the ancient designs that had been passed down on that fragment onto her body. And to me, it sounds like a, a process that's entirely too painful, but <laughs> for her, apparently, it was a statement that she was in control of her body and not her mm. vicious, unsavory husband. <laughs> It's yeah. interesting for me, I've never been to Japan, and it's interesting for me to listen to the people who've been there say that they their experience in Japan is of tattooing being, you know, the, the negative yeah. connotations of it. Because I, I work in an art gallery that has a, a Japanese garden attached. So one of the things, you know, we, we have a little bookshop there and we have books related to Japan and to art and to, to gardens and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got three books on Japanese ink tattooing in our art section. So it does sound like maybe there are some opposing kind of quite contradictory traditions because my impression just from those books, never having been to Japan, is that it is considered a great art form in Japan. Um, oh, yeah, lots of hands just went up. Brenda? Um, I read, and so I don't have the experience, but I read that um, the tattoos that are done in Japan pan are done under clothing so that people don't see them yep. and so when someone said that in the bathing home or bathing houses mm -hmm. that it was suggested not to have tattoos it would be make sure they're covered up the ones that you have mm -hmm. so maybe that brings together Which the two sides Brenda, that just suddenly made me think there was something in the um, in the book somewhere about um, people, I, I guess in the past, where there may have been rules about what people could or could not, what colors they could have on their kimonos. And there was a there was a passage somewhere in the book that talked about how people who you know perhaps were not of the the noble classes and weren't allowed to wear certain colors or designs would have them on the inside of their kimonos. Yeah. It was the lining yeah. of a very plain kimono. Mm. And what you just said gave me a little shiver. It gave me that feeling of 
hey, is that what the tattoos are like as well? I have tattoos mm-hmm. and they are incredibly meaningful for me. And I know, Carolyn, you recently posted a beautiful post about tattoos. So for me, it really, that, 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 that thing about claiming control of your body and your past and, and, and a tattoo of self-love really resonated for me. But maybe, I don't know, maybe when I'm in Japan, I'm going to have to cover them a little. <laughs> <laughs> so Sally, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? How the how yeah. what they mean to you? And the pain, and how painful it was. Um, or, or not. The pain of tattooing. No, there is pain in tattooing. I've only got two tattoos uh, and they're not very big. Um, my first tattoo was a way of reclaiming my emotional self. Um, I had a, I have, I don't know if anyone here has traveled to Peru and has seen the Nazca line, which mm. are these massive designs mm. in the desert floor, prehistoric designs of animals and geometric shapes and, and, and so on. And I, I went years, um, decades ago now, I, I, I flew over those with my partner at the time and we had a breakup that left me, that left me broken for a decade. And oh. I always, on all that time, I'd never had the tattoo and I wanted to tattoo the monkey, the Nazca monkey on my body. But I didn't want to do it because by doing it, I knew I was hitching myself to that painful past. I knew that, I knew that if, I, if I had that tattoo, it would be out of longing and heartbreak that I was going to have that tattoo. And when finally, eight or nine years after the breakup, I found myself again and got over that then I actually had the tattoo because it the whole meaning of a change the meaning was no longer that it was tying myself to a painful past it was saying hey I'm me now I can do this 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 has got nothing to do with this man it's to do with who I am and so it was a real break with 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 pain and a a claiming of of independence Mm -hmm. that was the first one so and the actual physical pain, yes, there is physical pain, but it's almost, it's nice pain. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pain, you're there, and, it, and it, it's like a reminder of being alive. It, it, it's just a, it sends that tingle through your whole body. Well, I, I'm sure it's not like that for everyone, but it was like that for me. I can see why people get addicted to physical sensation. Wow. <laughs> Carolyn, you wrote such a beautiful thing the other day about tattoos and your most recent tattoo. Did you want to talk about it or am I putting you on the spot? Well, I don't want to, you know, uh, take us in another direction, but um, but I have nine tattoos and uh, some are small and some are large. I have one down this whole arm and then I have another one down this whole arm and um, and this one I just got about a month ago, um, which is, uh, as Sally says, I really love that. Like this is for me, this one is ocean, it's freedom. It's, there's all kinds of things I've, I've written about, um, on my Instagram and my Facebook pages. And then this one is, um, related to wisdom and, my father's passing and so it's kind of past and present like it's weird Mm -hmm. um but I like having the the symbolism on my body because it reminds me um there's kind of two sides right there's your past your present and ocean earth and and so I can kind of touch them and see them every day and be reminded of you know being grateful right that I can that I have both so yeah and yes it hurts yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh does it hurt so yeah, the, the this one both were about six hours each so it's mm-hmm. it's um yeah mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> well now it, another, another whole side of it is is at the end of the story Ruth returns to a particular pillar at the Nanzen temple where she and her brother had played as children. Have you ever returned to a childhood landmark and noted how it has changed with the passage of time Mm -hmm. or how different it seems from your perspective as an adult? Mm -hmm. I don't know, is my sound working? My sound is working. Okay, it wasn't working before. I 
I was just asked if I'd ever done any school reunions because I was a conference planner and whatnot. And I was involved in my public school reunion in 1988 because I pulled out the book. Um, and it, and so it reminded me. And one of the things that I started that I instituted within that reunion, um, it was the 100th anniversary of the school, was um, organized walks around the neighborhood. And I moved, to, I mean, I moved away from there when I was, I think, nine or 10. And I walked by the house that I used to live in. And I had my oldest daughter with me. And I had always described the house as big. Um, yeah. And it was really <laughs> tiny. <Yeah. laughs> and, 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 yeah. and for me, the, the things that were missing was the front porch that we used to have. Um, and also... In the backyard, there were lilies of the valleys and lilacs. Mm -hmm. And lilacs are still one of my favorite flowers. And so it's almost like you can't go home again, but I did go home again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was really okay. And the people, um, and I'd arranged all of this beforehand. If we walked by any house that somebody had lived in, the people were allowing us to just kind of walk into the front door. Mm -hmm. And I walked back into that house and my God, it was tiny um and and I think that's what she did here in the book you look at it from a very different perspective because yeah. you're x number of years older then and my daughter had a really good laugh because she thought I lived in a mansion yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Susan yeah um I grew up in Johannesburg South Africa mm -hmm. and when I went back um about for the first for the first time in ages about 15 years ago everything had changed the politics the people the houses the shopping centers the um and it was very disorientating for me because what i remembered wasn't wasn't there at all some things were worse some things were better but the house that I grew up in until I left um, to go to college was just totally different in my eyes. And I can understand how she, she felt, the author, and how masterfully she wrote about what it was like weaving between certain cultures and, mm -hmm. and focusing on the kimono. But I learned so much about Japan even though I'd visited twice, I, this was just opened up a whole new world for me. Yeah, I, I have gone back um, and, and the town where I grew up was, when I left, was about 35,000. It's now about 200,000. So when I go home, um, I don't, it's like, it's not home. I mean, I get completely lost. I, I drive around the city. I have to use GPS just to figure out where I am until I get to my elementary school. Mm -hmm. And then I, from there to home, it, and driving down the street um, between my street and, and where the school is, the trees and the, the leaves on the sidewalk, it's just the same. And it's like, I can remember, you know, as, as I drive through, I remember sh as walking home from school, shuffling through the piles of leaves, you know, and, and it just, it brought back these floods of memories. But yes, but yet I could go three blocks away and be completely lost, you know, but I, as long as I could get into that little co cocoon, it was very comforting for me. So. Mm. I have the, the reverse, well, I don't know whether it's the reverse, yes. but um, uh, where my grandmother used to live, the house was bought and demolished. Mm. And I have this utter feeling of grief every time mm. I walk past that empty space yeah. because it was demolished illegally because it had heritage value and the buyer has never been allowed to replace it with anything. So it's just this dirt, like a, you know, a dirt car, and car park. Mm. And 
I cannot go past, uh, I now even just avoid the street when I'm in that town because mm -hmm. it just is this real overwhelming grief about, you know, the life I had as a child and so on and how there's, it's been completely, the, the, the whole place has just been completely eradicated off the face of the earth. I think it would feel much better if someone was allowed to build something yeah. there because then, you know, you sort of can move on, but just this, you know, mm. barren patch of land is just really horrid. You know, I feel very bad because there's, oh yeah, Elena, Elena yes. Well, I'm wondering, um, what the rest of you thought about the story, not uh, in addition to the yeah. kimono and the yeah, tradition, sure. etc. What what did you think about the actual plot and the the way she um, weaved it? That? <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. It 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 surprised me along the way, and a lot of mm -hmm. mysteries don't surprise me. This one surprised me quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I actually wasn't expecting a mystery. I was expecting more, which I got the other parts, the histories of the kimono and the culture and all of that stuff. I really wasn't expecting a mystery. Um, so I was very surprised. And and yeah. one of you said something about her um her husband being a real bastard. Yeah. Yes, he was. Mm. And, and I think that that's why she went through, was it, it was you, Elena? I think that's maybe why she went through the pain of having that put on her body. So he couldn't take that away from her. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I really enjoyed the story, but it lost me a little bit when it got to the point, now I can't remember the woman's name, but the the woman who killed the people, mm -hmm. when it got to her revealing why she did it. And mm -hmm. it yeah. just didn't ring true to me. Her, um, not the reason why she did it, but the whole revenge thing, I found just a little bit unbelievable that someone would go to those lengths to exact revenge when she was really taking it against the daughter mm -hmm. rather than the father mm -hmm. um and that yeah I still really enjoyed the story but when it got there I just thought uh -uh, it's, a, it's a bit too far now for me because the rest of it you know oh the the contacts with the underworld and and all that sort of thing I could totally see happening but then that twist just yeah didn't grab me at all what did you what think Elena um well I agree I thought that the first of all I I am interested in writing I'm, I'm working on a book myself but not remotely like this. So I'm always intrigued about the way that mystery writers can, can create a plot and have all of these elements integrate. Mm. And they do a pretty amazing job about that, having so many of these things revolve around this ancient piece of fabric and the connections between the family that really should have inherited it, the lover, of um what was her name it's like sudoku's but i can't yeah. Yeah. Satoko? Um, Satoko, i think Satoko. i thought all of the way she wove it together was really quite intriguing and it definitely was uh com confusing and surprising that the woman who was so vengeful went to so many lengths to extract her revenge, like actually writing the book that supposedly the author wrote that she was supposed to transfer. Mm -hmm. All of that was pretty fascinating. But I, I totally agree that A, how could one woman who is, she didn't seem like a very educated woman, 
from this tiny village in Japan, how could she not only write this book, but why did she kill so many people, mm -hmm. particularly the other writer? I didn't quite get that one. And, I, um, <laughs> and how did she even reach into the United States and ruin the, the narrator's chances of promotion? Mm -hmm. It seemed that part, some of it was a little too far-fetched for me. Mm -hmm. I don't think she wrote that book. That book was a collection and I was interested in that because at the beginning it was, it was, well, why is there this book? Why is it written as a letter and then as a diary and then as a something else? Um, and is this for some literary technique that it's being done that way? And even Ruth wonders at one stage, is it, is it meant to represent the patchwork quality of textiles or whatever? But in the end, we realize those were the actual letters and diary that she stole. So she, I, I don't think that, that, that she wrote that book at all. She just transcribed the letters and the diary and the other documents, the personal documents that she stole um, yeah. when she killed uh, the woman was my take on it. But I do, I do and I, I can see that, this, that revenge can drive a character, a fictional character to, to, to points of extremism. <laughs> But I do agree that the plot was incredibly complicated and it did overwhelm me at one point. Um, I found the, the inheritance laws very difficult to get my head around. And at one point I actually just remember sort of making the decision, okay, I don't need to understand this. I can just gloss over this. <laughs> too hard for me but maybe that wouldn't have been too hard for me if I was Japanese. Maybe it would all make sense. I don't know, but yeah, it was complicated. The plot, the plot brought a lot in. Does anybody know her background? The author, Rebecca Copeland. Yes, yeah, she, yeah, she is a. She's a. Oh yeah, you you joined us a little late. She's a professor of Japanese literature and language. She did live in Japan. Um, she was born in Japan. Her of missionary parents, and then she came back to the U.S. Lived in the U.S. but went back to Japan when she was in college and also for her PhD and has been going back many, many times since then. Sorry, Wendy. I was going to say, there are so many themes and we've really not even touched on a few of them, but I'm kind of saying the time and we have Brenda here to talk about tea and oh, um, yeah. so, <laughs> I, Carolyn, what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts, Carolyn? <laughs> Yeah, I, I do. I, I just made myself a cup of tea. So yeah. I'm hoping Brenda will talk a little bit about it. But I do want to say, you know, I, I did ask her why, like, even the human trafficking thing was kind of like, um, a little bit of a, a surprise to me in reading that book. And, um, and I think she's, I think, in her own way, she was trying to show an authentic perspective on Kyoto and, and, you know, safety is an issue there. The way women are treated is an issue there. You know, we may not see it as travelers and tourists, but that's what she wanted mm -hmm. to share with us. And, and so I, I appreciate that um, from her and, um, and we're going to actually be doing a little bit more on human trafficking in the next few weeks. Um, and Sandy, who's on this call has been a big catalyst for all of that. So um, so I think it's an important topic for us to know about. And I'm actually, you know, I, I'm pleased to see it mentioned because I think by ignoring it, we we need to be talking about these things and be aware mm. of these things. So, um, something that, so I do, sorry, sorry, Sally, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say it's something that's coming up quite a bit in the books we've we've read. I know in, in Laura Meyer's book, Tell Them My Name, it was mentioned. There was another book that we read uh, soon after that where it came up. Um, and yeah, I agree. It's a very, it's, it's such an important topic because it's, it's almost as if we managed to, to have two existences but when we travel, but even where we live, you know, there, oh, there, there's absolutely. a lot it's not that just goes a travel on that problem. We, and we, even those of us who maybe know a little bit about it can manage to, you know, live 29 days out of the month without it even crossing our minds when it's going around or around us. So yeah, I agree. We should, we should be opening our eyes more to it. Yeah. I don't want to uh, off topic of the book, but everybody should have whatever country you're in, 
there is generally an 800 number for that country. Um, and uh, because I'm not really adept at doing 29 things at once, um, I can send it out later where you can find out what that 800 number is and put it in your phone. Um, because there's oftentimes you see something and you're not sure what it is and you can still report it. Um, and that she brought it into the book. I also thought was very interesting, but, um, I think there was too many themes closer to the end of the book. There was too many threads mm, that yeah. all of a sudden were there. Um, and so that kind of threw me off for a little bit. Mm. Um, mm. yeah. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Wendy and Sally and, and Brenda. I just want to give you a few minutes, if you don't mind, to, to share your expertise on tea, because it, it's kind of a, a central theme here as well in the book. Okay, I haven't read the book. I read two reviews. And just to go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, I'm just wondering if it's not a cultural dissonance that we've got in that maybe um, the way that we think about losing face is very different than the way that culturally in the East, losing face is something that's really quite uh, embarrassing. And people have been brought up to really, I mean, you know, Harry Carey commits suicide, mm. something goes wrong. Anyway, so that's just my thought on what we were just talking about. Um, I didn't realize how much Japan has affected my life. Um, Carolyn asked me to do this a week ago, and I thought, oh, I can't do it. I don't know that much. I mean, I just really don't. Uh, most of the tea that I've been drinking is Chinese tea. And so I did a little bit of um, digging, and I found out that things that I wasn't, you know, conscious of, that um, tea is from the tea plant that's called Camellia sinensis. So every tea is from one plant, the way that um, every wine is from one grape. And there are many different types of tea that are not tea. So herbal teas, rubius tea is an herbal, it's from South Africa. Um, but the Darjeeling, the um, white tea, yellow tea, green tea, dark teas like pu'er and black teas are all from one plant. And it's just a matter of where they're grown, when they're picked, and how the production is with each of them that makes them so different. And so it was um, in China, I think in BC 2737, I think if I remember my numbers, that the first history of tea in China happened. And then um, it was brought to Japan, I believe, in the 8th century, and I believe the British brought tea to India in the 1800s, so I'm kind of thinking like when my great-grandparents were alive, that happened. Um, and so the history is very different in each country. The ceremonies are very different. I know in China, they're a lot more like we would go out and socialize and have a drink together, and that's the kind of tea I do. Yeah. Um, with, you know, getting tea drunk and whatnot. But um, in Japan, <laughs> it's very much aligned with um, Buddhism and with um, very mm. um, serene mm. religious. Mm. And they brought it to an art form and it's evolved over time. Uh, I just realized that I have a lot of clothing that is from Japan. I bought um, a lot of it every time I would go to visit my parents in Ottawa I would go to Kaliana and purchase something so I have what's known as I guess a working kimono which I didn't know that there were differences you know it's, it's just plain black and I'm sure you've seen people wearing just a very plain cotton um, kimono so not some of the ones that are more ornate and one of the other things I didn't realize is that um, kimonos can go as much as ten thousand dollars just with all the embroidery and the the painting and the the work that goes into them. Um, I then just before Carolyn asked me to do this, I had just signed up for a Japanese um, embroidery class doing the running stitch, and it's done in geometric forms, and it's along with the same. Thing that you were talking about with the kimonos all being repurposed and so um 
no clothes were thrown out. They were all patched and sewn together. And I'm sure you've seen them with the navy blue um, <clears throat> fabric and the white stitching that's very geometric. Um, so there's a, a deep history with the tea. There's a deep history in the culture and then modernized um, culture is very different. And I do drink matcha and that's part of the tea ceremony but it's a very modern version of it so I thought I'd show a few of the pieces that I've got and some of the things I mean many of you may know a lot more than I do and speak up for sure but one thing that I was surprised I'd always bought matcha that was culinary grade thinking that was great no um, you're supposed to be getting the ceremonial is much better it's more expensive but it's deeper green it's really a uh, very um, rich beautiful color and taste so um i prepared a pdf and i gave it to um carolyn and i've got an update on it i think i've got some more things to add to it that i'll send you um that have links of where i bought tea and different places that i know are good places to get it but so ceremonial tea I didn't even know there was a difference then I remember one time going into a Japanese shop and picking up a, one of the whisks and bringing it up to the counter thinking it's going to be four dollars or something like that and he came rang it up and it was something like 159 dollars <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> no, I didn't really mean to get that what I'll does that do Brenda can you explain that um basically they're okay this is the whisk that you use in the bowl to whip mm. the powder and I'll talk about that a little bit more <laughs> the the whisks are very um they're very curled at the end so basically you can see the they come from a, sh a bamboo shoot so you can see the bamboo okay and you mm -hmm. can get a hundred cuts have been made oh. and then it's been formed and the inside has been formed there's a holder i've used this one a number of times and the holder helps to form keep this formed because it de deforms when you're whisking it which i didn't know that either and you don't put your your whisk down this way you put it this way because it's very delicate and in order for you not to break it you always warm your bowl with water and then you put your whisk inside so that it gets a little bit more flexible throughout the water and then you have to dry your bowl if you don't dry your bowl when you put the powder in it will clump and so it becomes really important to have a warm bowl to have it dry to have it um, ready to take the whisking and the water that you use is, um, and I'm sure Carolyn, you know this because you've started to drink uh, green tea, that you don't use boiling water the way we would with black tea. You use a water that's cooled slightly. So with matcha, you use something that's about, um, I think 80 degrees between 80 and 70. If you want it to be milder, you would use a 70 degree and I'm talking Celsius which would be 58 ish I think in Fahrenheit um, and for that I went and I bought myself a, an electric kettle that I can put and have the temperature um, just be exactly what I want it to be for the teas that I'm using um, oftentimes incense is used and so I bought a few little pieces of incense but I find that it can take away from the pleasure the aroma of drinking the tea unless you're going to be doing it for a long period of time a lot of the Japanese tea ceremonies go on for four hours if Joy was here she could tell us about one that she went to that was quite long and they serve two different teas their matcha and food and usually there's about five or six people and usually everybody is kneeling and joy said it was really hard on her knees because yes. she was kneeling for four hours but mm. i happen to have a thing that you kneel on i've got two of them i'm sitting on kneeling i'm not kneeling on one i'm sitting on one um so basically people would bring something like this 
Okay. The cheese ceremony, and then you would sit on it and your legs tuck under. And um, so you were a lot more comfortable than Joy would have been when she was kneeling on her knees for four hours. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm just looking around. I usually buy huge bags. I On the PDF that I have given to Carolyn, I've got, again, links. And links of where I first discovered um, tea, it was during the pandemic, and I realized that I need to get something to do if I'm going to be in isolation by myself. And I bought myself a 24 um, little pots of Advent tea from Van Damme, which was an Indian company, very sustainable. And then I received it and I realized I don't know how to brew this type of tea. So I Googled it and came across two um, videos on YouTube that just flabbergasted me. One was about the ceremony and how everything on the right happens and everything on the left happens and the whole dance that goes along with it. And I thought, well, no, no, I just needed to know how to brew this one little cup of tea. And so I went to the one underneath and it was May Leaf, who is Dawn and Ceylon who have a tea house in London and Dawn was so authentic he's just hilarious and his wife is so lovely they have a child now um, and he the first one I read was about getting tea drunk and they were talking about a tea that's called resin uh, resin um resin empress or something like this and his wife does all of the illustrations on the paper and so I bought it and you know I had this hundred dollar cake of tea land on my doorstep that I was so excited to receive but then I was too afraid to get into it and open it and then I found out that you can um you can store them and they get better and better so I mean I'm just like yay I'm not drinking it I'm just waiting for it to get better and better and to go back and revisit that um, video which I have on the PDF and it's quite hilarious I mean it was just it was the thing that took me down the rabbit hole and I haven't mm -hmm. come up with it since so um, has anybody else had experience with with tea I have a question Brenda yes now, this may sound really naive but when you buy a tea block yes do you, do you scrape off I mean how, um, how, I don't do you, how do you get it from a tea block to I mean, do you need there, to put it in a in a there are knives, but you take a pick and you go in and you try not to um, try not to break the leaves because part of the beauty in drinking a, a cup of tea is seeing the actual leaves come to life and get larger. And so there's an art to it. And YouTube is like great to go and take a look, but you just stick it part way through and you pry and you push and you, if it starts to hit a wall, then you go to another part and you do it. And eventually it'll fall and you'll get a piece big enough for what you want. And usually people use about five grams. I use about three grams. I don't go into, um, you know, like a whole session. I'll just have a nice afternoon cup of, cup of tea. But good question, yeah. And there's so many things you can buy. I've spent so much money. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard the term tea drunk before. Um, maybe because I, I I I can't drink tea. I get I get migraines from tea, so unfortunately that pleasure is um, is unknown to me. But what is tea drunk? I... It's I guess it's having so much caffeine in your yes. system, and the way that the Chinese the gung fu ceremonies go it's very social and there will be about five grams of tea put into a teapot and then boiling water if it's a black tea poured on and it's immediately poured into a sharing cup so a sharing cup would look a little bit like this with a pour on it mm -hmm. so that everybody who's being served would have um, the exact same strength of tea. It wouldn't be coming out of a teapot at a different um, strength. Mm. Okay. And so these sessions go on. That same 
bit of leaf after it's been poured into this to share then into cups from the teapot um, would then have boiling water poured back on. They, you can go through about um, 10, 15 different pourings on that one five gram of tea. So it's very different than what we do is put it in a teapot and let it brew for five minutes. Mm. There's this immediately poured and it's very strong. Um, and each one, each round brings out a different quality of tea. So you may start with fruity, you may end up with nutty, you may go in through into chocolatey forms. There are um, books and I bought some where you take notes on what the tea tastes like in the first minute, in the second round, the fourth round, how many rounds you've got. So that when you go back to your expensive block of tea um, and you're inviting people over, People may ask you, you know, maybe what kind of tea do you like? And you can say, well, this one's got fruit. This one's got, you know, what do you prefer? And so then that's how you would pick from your stash of 50 different types of tea, possibly, which one you might want to share, which one your friends may want to want to have. And then you can go from one type to another type. And this could go on for hours. Yeah. I'm afraid to ask how many types of tea you have. I haven't counted. <laughs> Yeah. You, don't have Carol, Carol, you know my my travel budget we're real uh, close we're real close yeah, yeah. yeah. Has, has anyone been to china i was there maybe six years ago and i wanted to show oh maybe i have to do something with my screen hang on i think i have to un uh blur my background Okay. Everyone carried these yes. on the street. Yes, with, with hot water in them. Well, it was like a plant and hot water. Yeah. So this is an American one and it has the little tea strainer in it. But yeah. their tea strainer was huge and it looked like there was a plant inside it. And I just thought, wow, that gets stronger and stronger all day long. Like by the end of, you know, by two o'clock, if you left your house in the morning with this, and it just kept steeping and steeping because it really, this one's an American one and has a cork thing on it, but it would be like a plant of leaves and they would just carry this around all day. Well, what I understand from having watched a lot of vid videos of people who are doing the ceremonies, they will go out in nature and they'll have a bottle like that. And also in their backpack, they've got boiling water in a thermos. And so they are continuously pouring this in and drinking it right away. So they don't drink tea the same way we do. So it doesn't get stronger and stronger all day. No, because they probably would drink it all. And then it would, the plant would sit in it and they would still have their backpack full of hot water. Thermos. Hot water. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Thank you. That's super helpful. Thank you. That was so interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank yes, you. That's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I know we've gone a little overboard, but um, but thank you, Brenda, and everybody for participating. And I just want to mention our next book is um and it's great. <laughs> the Girl with the Louding Voice, uh, yeah. by Abby Duray, which takes place in Nigeria in a month. And uh, I'm going to start reading it this weekend. I can't wait to um, to get mm -hmm. going on it. And uh, yeah, so amazing. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And look so forward to you coming all. together with and all of you. Brenda's tea tips uh, yeah. for those that are interested. <laughs> and we can learn all about tea. Yeah. See you yeah. next Thanks, month. Brenda. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.